Most people in life are looking for how to make a living and how to make a life worth living. They're also looking for how to handle themselves in a lot of situations. The challenge we run into today is that a lot of people aren't doing the same things every single day, and so it's hard for them to know exactly precisely what to say, when to say it, and how to say it when they're in the business setting. What I usually recommend is when someone is working in their home office, that they have a clipboard next to their desk, and that allows them to have a form, if you will, that allows them to guide a person through their sales process. What I mean is it's an intake form. That way your salespeople, even your customer service people, don't mess up in missing out on a potential sale for your company. Let's face it, websites today are supposed to be promoting you to the point that someone picks up the phone and actually dials you and starts to talk to you about your business practice or your particular uh, shtick that you're selling. The reality is that if we don't do this well, we aren't going to get that sale. Every time in my office, I was always working on a million different projects, and I knew how hard it was to pull myself away from what I was working on intellectually and uh, psychologically to get into a telephone call with someone you're calling. So what I would always do is have those clipboards for those different projects next to my desk so that as soon as I understood what the person was calling about, I could grab the clipboard and walk them through the process. This made sure that every single client that came into our programs always went through the same educational process, not only about what we did for a living, but also how we serve people, but then also we were able to gather the information that we needed to make sure that first and foremost, we were a legitimate potential prospect or client. Second of all, that they weren't someone just scoping our business, trying to do something to illicitly or illegally take information from us, which a lot of competitors try and do. And thirdly, to make sure that we would actually have a real sale come out of it, meaning the first step of our process, which was some sort of an evaluation to determine whether or not that individual or their student was a right fit to our program. Now, in life, we have moments of time to make all the difference in the world for people. I talk about this regularly in the audio cast, and I talk about it regularly in terms of other people who are launching different social justice programs in the community. It's kind of unusual just to throw up a video and expect people to get it and why they should participate in the social justice program. It's very important that you have a presenter who sort of not only offsets the program, but is directing people back to the actual program itself, meaning who is involved in the program at the local level, meaning at that organization that's launching that program, so that if you have a guest speaker, they're not totally talking about themselves alone. You have to make sure that the people that you bring in are really interested in helping you to grow your own programs, not just to talk about the topic, because if you don't have a good liaison to not only preset that program, meaning set up the speaker and give them a little bit of accolades for the fact that they're guests in terms of a keynote, but and then also wrap up the program with some sort of discussion that brings people back to the local level, you might just lose out the opportunity of what we might call a sale. A lot of nonprofits do this problem. They bring in a speaker and they think that someone is just going to get it in their minds of why they should participate, how they can participate, and what they should do to participate in any type of program. A lot of social justice programs are focusing on homelessness today, and the reality is that homelessness abounds. Why homelessness occurs are multiple and a lot of reasons, actually, but most people assume and presume it's due to vice. I would have to tell you that an affluent community has nothing to do with vice most of the time. Sure, there are some folks who have codependency issues, but we don't need to talk about that today. What we want to really talk about are the people who are living paycheck to paycheck. According to a career builder study that was done in January of this last year, or this year rather, we really learned that most people are at 78% uh, of people are uh, allegedly living paycheck to paycheck, which pretty much means they're not putting any money away for retirement. Now, if they were part of a great program, then they might have a good retirement. If they didn't have a super great retirement, they might have to be working what we call bridge jobs, because unfortunately for most Americans today, that we don't value agedness and we don't value seasoning of employees, which is a shame. Because what that means is we've got 20-somethings and unders who might be uh, discrediting our programs because they don't have enough seasoning and working in the field to know how to interact with all people. That is the value of hiring people who've had a little bit of seasoning in what they're doing. We also have a challenge in terms of employment and that what we're doing now is requiring people to utilize computers to go online and develop applications as opposed to networking where people have social connections to the folks who are working in the firm. Now that's not the case in every situation, but if you go to any work one institution, you learn that in truth, there's always someone who's got a computer program that will outwit the, the job hunter. Most job hunters are not accustomed to writing uh, different types of keywords that allow their resume to be picked up, not only by LinkedIn and other social networks, but also by those online applicant tracking systems that are looking for specific words according to the hiring manager. Then you end up getting a call if you've done a good enough job with those keywords from a 20 to 30 something employee who really has absolutely no concept of your industry and is just asking you the kind of the standard grooming questions which are do you have good transportation 
what, when can you come in for an interview, that sort of stuff. And if you don't do well with that individual, if you don't mesh with their soul in some way, you miss out on talking to the actual HR manager who's more likely in your age demographic. This is a challenge for people who are over 40. Definitely as we head into our 50s, it is a challenge. Now, what I'm talking about is real world, and what we're talking about in politics today is sort of unreal world. We have to get back to the basics of America, that we need food to live. And if people don't start protecting our land from the people who are coming in from foreign lands, we might just lose out a lot. It's sort of unusual to go into a restaurant and find that the person who is serving you at the table at $10 an hour drives a fancier, more expensive car than you do. It makes me question, go, hmm, doesn't it make you question that? Because then you're wondering, okay, do they live in a house of 10 people, therefore they can afford it? Or do they really not have the right to have that vehicle, but somehow they acquired that vehicle through a different type of means, and we'll just leave it at that. Now, when I'm talking about this, I'm making observations as I'm walking through the community. I also see lots of power lines that are dragging down from the, the <coughs> ropes in, this, in, the, in the air, if you will, as we like to call those telephone poles and electrical poles, but also I see electrical boxes that have been totally ripped apart and left alone. I sort of doubt that the electrician who is paid by the city, or whoever did that work, did it like that. What that means is we've got people monkeying with electricity, and we have to be careful of that. I also saw a cord dangling down from the poles att attached to a tree. Now that tree is grounded, but any kid walks up and grabs that tree. You know, old scientists' classes that we learned in second grade would say, hey, there might be a problem there. Now what I'm talking about is real-world things. We're talking about real-world politics, and definitely we're looking at what's coming up in this, this upcoming election. Now when we talk about these things, we're really looking at who's who. What are they going to bring to the table? How will they protect her rights? One of the challenges that everybody's up really upset about is that our current presidency is sort of in a position of not telling the full out truth. That allows the rest of the American people to feel like they don't have to tell the truth. Now, I always say there's two types of truth. There's true and that what is true, and then there's truth. What I mean by that is that sometimes we have confidentiality agreements, or we have proprietary information, or we simply have non-disclosure items that are not anyone's business. That is the truth. Now, when we talk about things that are true, we're talking about who did what, why they did it, and whether or not it impacted someone positively or negatively. We talk a great deal about that in our other different audio casts that we'll be recording a little later today. What I'm saying is that when you're in line with someone with regard to their lineage, it's important that you pay attention to them. Whether that's in employment or whether that's in a family, you have to pay attention to what is true versus what is truth. And that's what we're talking about today. Truth in politics. So we have to look at our political candidates and go, Who's going to be the most true, or who's going to provide us the most truth in the current coming election? It's a good thing that so far we're seeing some good courtesies going on and not a lot of muckraking, as the old journalism dog in me would call it. And what we learned long ago is when candidates start to disparage one another because they don't have anything politically astute to say. I find that offensive. I found it offensive for years. It's probably why I haven't participated in many elections. But I am actually consulting two of the candidates at the present time, and I'm seeing their actual language change and shift based on what I say to them through social media, and that's good. We need to get people focused on what's really happening in the world today, which is people are needing employment, people are needing jobs, we're needing safety from police by all means, and we definitely are needing to make sure that politicians are not monsterizing people who are innocent in the land. Now, that's it for today. I hope you had an interesting conversation with your other folks in your office with regard to what we've talked about today, and I wish you all a great day.